now, uh, th this is really one of the great, great moments of the conference when we do the Gold Baton Award. And you know, we do one of these every year. And uh, this is how we celebrate and acknowledge those who've made an extraordinary contribution to our field over a long period of time and broadly and deeply. And uh, I couldn't be happier that this year's Gold Baton winner is none other than the composer Joan Tower. And she is nothing less than one of the most important American composers working today. Her career spans more than 50 years. She's made lasting contributions to musical life in the United States as not only as a composer, but also performer, conductor, and educator. Her works have been commissioned by major ensembles, soloists, and orchestras, including the Emerson Tokyo and Muir String Quartet, soloist Evelyn Glennie, Carol Winsense, David Schifrin, Paul Neubauer, and John Browning, and the orchestras of Chicago, New York, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Nashville, Albany, and Washington, D.C., among others. In 1990, Joan became the first woman to win the prestigious Grauermeyer Award for Silver Ladders. She was the first composer chosen for the League's Ford Made in America Consortium Commission of 65 orchestras. The Nashville Symphony and conductor Leonard Slatkin recorded that work, Made in America, together with Tambor and Concerto for Orchestra. The recording won three, single recording won three 2008 Grammy Awards, Best Contemporary Classical Composition, Best Classical Album, and Best Orchestral Performance. Nashville's latest all-tower recording includes Stroke, which received a 2016 Grammy nomination for Best Contemporary Classical Composition. Joan was pianist and founding member of the, of the De Capo Chamber Players, which commissioned and premiered many of her most popular works. Her first orchestral work, Sequoia, commissioned by the American Composers Orchestra, quickly entered the repertory. Her six fanfares for The Uncommon Woman, we heard one of them on Monday evening, by the way, dedicated to our next keynote speaker, Tanya Leon. Uh, those have been played by over 600 different ensembles. Her composer residencies with orchestras include the St. Louis Symphony, the Pittsburgh Symphony, the Albany Symphony, and a decade with the Orchestra of St. Luke's. She's received honorary doctorates from Smith College, the New England Conservatory, and Illinois State University. She's currently Asher Edelman Professor of Music at Bard College, where she has taught since 1972. You know, it's natural that we uh, uh, recognize and celebrate composers for the music that they give us. Um, and Joan has given us some unbelievable catalog of music to celebrate and feel really good about. Um, but she's also someone that we treasure as a person. And, um, you know, when we did the, um, the Ford Made in America project, which was um, kind of an extraordinary movement, really, of our small budget orchestras to come together and say, we want to be in on this new music thing. We, 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 we need some help, but we also have some power, because there's a lot of us. And by the way, you know that uh, 90% of America's orchestras have budgets under $1 million. 60% have budgets under $300,000. Yeah. <laughs> Those are, th those are facts I always share when I'm in front of funders and policymakers and media people so they understand the more complete story of orchestras in the United States. So that group of orchestras mobilized to be part of the, a movement to become more involved with new music. And it, it was so important that Joan was the composer who initiated that effort because not only did she write a sensational piece that won three Grammy Awards, but she went, she didn't go to all 65 words, but I think she went to at least a dozen, if not more. But Joan embraced this work with a kind of zeal and curiosity about who, who are these organizations? Why do these orchestras work? And she thought about who they were and what their communities were like and what their artistic forces were like as she created the piece and then helped them introduce her piece into their communities. And the success of that program was not only the amassing of many orchestras together, but also Joan's unique enthusiasm and energy that she brought uh, to being part of the work of this, such an important body of orchestras in our country. Um, when I think about Joan, I think of somebody who is deeply caring. She's generous, energetic, sympathetic, down to earth, and very often, downright hilarious. 
And uh, I'm going to give you a chance to experience that uh, with a very short video clip that comes from um, our Ford Made in America project. So let's, uh, let's see the video. When you go to an orchestral concert, you're probably going to hear mostly dead composers and mostly men composers. I'm alive and I'm a woman. And so that makes me a kind of a different breed. I think it's incredibly important for the living composer to be forward and front and center in the orchestral world because uh, it reminds us that it's, it's a living art form and uh, that Beethoven once was alive and he was challenged and criticized and, and uh, condemned and praised, and, and that's good for the art form because it makes people think about what they're hearing. So when I'm next to Beethoven, I think I help Beethoven, actually, because the audience feels empowered to criticize me. Who is this composer, they say? What, oh, we're going to hear this horrible new piece today? I just came here to hear my beloved Beethoven. But my piece makes them sit up and criticize. I like this piece. I don't like this piece. I like it because. I don't like it because. And maybe that somehow goes over to Beethoven. Because Beethoven is, is now so enshrined, and he's one of my favorite composers, I have to add. But he's so enshrined in gold and uh, encased in this gigantic statue that uh, everybody goes, oh, well, I, I can't have an opinion about that. He's too big for me, too famous, too big, blah, blah. So they retreat into their seats. But with me, they sit up. That's too loud. Four cowbells, that's way too much noise. <laughs> you know. And I like that. And I finally learned to appreciate that after all these years hanging around these many worlds of music, I want the orchestra world being one of them. It's, um, it's an important thing for me to be there and every other living composer to be there. Please welcome Joan Tower. This is uh, beyond an honor to receive this award. When I called up Jesse and I said, so who got this award? Uh, he's looking up. He forgot, actually. He was looking up and said, oh, Yo-Yo Ma, Leonard Bernstein. I'm going, what? You want me to follow these people? <laughs> and then the last composer, I think, was living composer. Uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I think it was 1990, somebody told me, Robert Ward, I think it was. Has there ever been a woman? You're not going to be able to answer that, I know. I don't think so. I'm the first. <laughs> you know, I'm 80 years old. You'd never know it, but I am. And you actually, don't look too closely. But uh, <laughs> at this age, as a woman composer, this is amazing for me. And I think for other women, too. Because um, at this age, you know, composers are very isolated. And they're not always honored, especially women composers. We have a terrible history. Terrible. I didn't even know that I was one of the pioneers coming along. I didn't know it. I was just trying to write a good solo clarinet piece, you know. Um, so it took me a while to learn that history. It's, it's not a good history, actually, as compared to the other arts. And so I've become an advocate not only for women composers, but for living composers. Because what I said there wasn't actually off the beat too much. We've settled into a kind of a, a little bit of a museum 
uh, which is not a good thing for Beethoven. I still believe that, actually. And Beethoven is, is, I know, you're thinking, oh, come on. Beethoven's played all the time. He has no problem. Well, I think it's fair to put him next to somebody else who is new to, to, to get that appreciation of what Beethoven actually does higher. Beethoven is one of my favorite composers and, in fact, was a big influence on me because I played all his piano music and chamber music and the sense of architecture and the sense of uh, uh, motivated, I call it a motivated architecture plus risks, which he takes all the time, is just extraordinary. Um, so I learned a lot from him. So I, I want him next to me. Well, I don't want him next to me. No, that's not true. <laughs> Marin also did a piece of mine at, uh, with Baltimore Symphony, and the other piece on the program was Beethoven's Ninth. <laughs> I said, okay, Marin, are you trying to bury me or what? <laughs> yeah, and I've been between a lot of dead composers, males, usually. And it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge. It's a good challenge for them, too, not just for me. So uh, anyways, uh, to make a long story short, I want to thank the League, which um, had me as their first Made in America uh, project, which was amazing, as Jesse said. It, it was an amazing challenge to go into 65 community orchestras. I went to 20 um, and I conducted eight because they double and triple booked. And I learned a lot about the community orchestras in this country, which are amazing. Because guess what? They love to make music. They, they're not in it for the money because most of them don't make much money. It's, it's a kind of an alternative to their day jobs, which may not be so interesting. And they, they'll, they'll practice until 12 instead of 10 if they have to, because they really love what they're doing. And so that project opened me up to a lot of what's going on in this country in the smaller towns. Um, um, and I want to thank the Nashville Symphony for <laughs> Um, I did two recordings with them, and they are one of the best orchestras of this country. Really solid and, and very uh, good chops. They have good chops. And Guerrero's an amazing conductor. Why? Because he loves now, now he loves living composers. And he puts them on all his programs, and he's commissioning people right and left. So he's breathing a different kind of life into this orchestral community uh, here, which is alive and well, and people accept it too. They're not afraid of it, like they are in some communities. Uh, so I, I, I applaud him and that orchestra. And there are several other conductors. It's the conductors who make the choices, right? Uh, David Allen Miller from the Albany Symphony he knows every composer from A to Z, from age 18 to age 80, and he takes the composers he loves, doesn't matter style, doesn't matter age, doesn't matter race, gender, anything. He just picks the pieces he likes, and he puts them out there all the time in his community, and his community accepts it. They love it. It's a, it's a very big community, and they they go with the flow, you know. Um, also, uh, Leonard Slacken, who changed my life actually, because um, he took me on as composer in residence with St. Louis when I had written only one piece, and I told him, I said, you know, you're taking a big risk with me, and he said, you wrote one really interesting piece. I'm going to help you write more, and then he took me all over the place and recorded and and. He's another one that knows composers and loves them and picks what he likes and, and is very actively behind them in spite of marketing, audience resistance, everything. So those three conductors, or the ones I've worked with, are, are really cutting paths uh, to the future. 
And I hope that happens with your orchestras, wherever you are. You need to impress your conductor. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's some conductors here too. And so because we are, we have to get out of the museum and we have to include more and more women and it's happening now. Now it's happening. It's happening. In the last three hours, I've gotten three notifications that there are three uh, events happening of all women composers. This is starting to happen on a big scale. There's a momentum going, which is wonderful. I know some of you don't like that categorization, but we need to be, they need to be heard. We have so many wonderful composers in this country. They need to be heard. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. Um, Tanya Leon, uh, another composer um, who, uh, like Joan, uh, we appreciate not only for the body of music she's leaving us, continues to create for orchestras, but also for the kind of person she is. And uh, I had the very good fortune to work closely with Tanya. We traveled through Latin America together over a five-year period where, uh, for the American Composers Orchestra, we were organizing annual festivals of music from Latin America. And each year we would do a different country. And we were Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, and uh, Mexico. Uh, we traveled to those countries together, meeting with composers and performers to bring them back to festivals in, in New York to play in Carnegie Hall and in venues all over New York City. And um, traveling with Tanya was really a trip because we'd, we'd go to these meetings with composers and uh, people would just like swarm all over Tanya. Everybody knew her. Everyone wanted, wanted to talk to her, wanted to be in the room, and she was just like a complete magnet. And, um, you know, the same thing happens in New York City. Like, if you go to a concert in New York and you see Tanya and you want to go say hello to her, forget about it. I mean, you just can't get near her. People just swarm around her because there's so much affection and enthusiasm and joy in music making and in supporting and helping other people making music that. Uh, everyone just wants to be in her orbit. Um, she is, of course, though, a, uh, a composer and a conductor and an educator. And um, let's see, where are we? Oh, yes. And uh, uh, she has been the subject of major profiles on ABC, CBS, CNN, PBS, Univision, Telemundo, and in independent films. Her recent commissions include The Little Rock Nine, an opera with libretto by Tulani Davis and historical research by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. A new work for Project 19 with the New York Philharmonic, Sare for the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and one more time for the De Capo Chamber Players. Her appearances as guest conductor include the Symphony Orchestra of Marseille, the Gewandhaus Orchestra Leipzig, and the Orchestra Sinfonica de Guanajuato in Mexico, among many others. She's a founding member of the Dance Theater of Harlem. She instituted the Brooklyn Philharmonic Community Concert Series and was co-founder of the ACO Sonidos de las Americas Festivals. And uh, also a uh, new music advisor to the New York Philharmonic and founder and artistic director of Composers Now, a nonprofit in New York City founded in 2010 and dedicated to empowering living composers. Tanya is a professor at Brooklyn College since 1985 and was named Distinguished Professor of the City University of New York in 2006. In 2010, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and in 2013, she was the recipient of the prestigious 2013 ASCAP Victor Herbert Award. Most recently, she was awarded a 2018 United States Artist Fellowship and is a newly elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. Please join me in welcoming Tanya Leon. Hi, I, <laughs> I never saw the world from up here. Uh, first of all, I would like to dedicate my talk to Jesse Rosen. You already heard that we have a, an association, collaboration, and a friendship dating from the 1990s. I'm talking about the beginning of the 1990s. So, my talk contains some of the things that he had mentioned already 
that if you don't mind, I will mention again. And the talk, or the title of the talk is Inclusion as a Verb. I am honored to have the opportunity to speak with you this morning and to share some of my thoughts about what inclusion can mean for an orchestra. I want to thank the League of American Orchestras for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. What I want to impress upon you today is not just how a spirit of inclusion can help living composers, usually underrepresented in our concert programming, but how such a spirit of inclusion can contribute to the health and sustainability of the orchestra itself. Diversity is a hot term these days, but without a conscious effort toward inclusion, diversity is only a concept. But first, I would like to offer you a glimpse of my background so you can understand the perspective I am coming from. I started studying piano when I was four years old. My upbringing was modest. My family had little means, but at my grandmother's insistence, the professors at the conservatory agreed to start teaching me theory even before I had learned to read or write. And I'm gonna to talk to about my grandmother because I always celebrate her everywhere I go. She taught me without knowing persistence and determination. When the professors of the conservatory told my grandmother, she's four years old, she doesn't know how to read and write, we cannot accept her. My grandmother kept insisting. I don't know how many times she went to the conservatory. Probably when they saw her, they say, whoa, there she's gone, it's a woman again. And then finally, talking to one of the professors, the professor said, she won't be able to understand theory. She doesn't know how to read. My grandmother said, can you try the first lesson and give me the lessons of theory that she had to learn? Well, what happened is that from early age, I apparently memorized a lot of things. And one of the things was poetry. There was a poetry called Los Zapaticos Me Aprietans. Do you know what it means? Los Zapaticos Me Aprietan. That means the little shoes are too tight, right? And that was a poetry that sometimes, you know, nobody was asking for me to recite it, and I would go in front of everybody and say, los zapaticos me aprietan, las medias me dan calor. You know, the thing is that, based on that, my grandmother took me to where she had her lines of clothes, you know, being air and dry by the sun, and she made me memorize the first questions of the theory book. And to this day, I remember, ¿qué cosa es la música? La música es el bien, de, el arte de bien combinar los sonidos y el tiempo. So that means what is music is the art of combining sounds and time. So she took me back to the conservatory and she told the teacher, ask her, ask her. The, 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 <laughs> the thing is that I recited that, voila. They said, okay, we'll take her. <laughs> All of my family was involved in supporting my musical education, even if a career in music was far from anybody's minds. They observed from an early age that music was my passion. And what happened is that, what they recall is that at that very early age, I used to go to the radio and dial, you know, different stations. And every time that there was music, I would dance the music in perfect, you know, coordination with the rhythm. Sometimes, if I knew the song, I was singing exactly in the first, the pitches of the song accordingly. And it was curious for my grandmother that when I got to the classical music station, I was just stare at the, the radio because nobody at home would listen to that class, I mean, that, that kind of music. So that what gave her the idea to take me to a conservatory. Yet, when I was nine years old, I told my family that my dream was to go to Paris, study at the Paris Conservatoire, and build a career as a concert pianist. Why? Well, my teacher went to Paris. He was a clavichembalist, and he sent me a card of the Eiffel Tower. 
I saw the Eiffel Tower, and they told me, it's the Eiffel Tower. Where is that? In Paris. And where is Paris? In France. And I declare at that moment, that is where I'm going to live. You see? The thing is that at home, I had all these different places, you know, of pictures of artists, and I had Elvis Presley and the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> <laughs> However, a twist of fate determined that I would arrive in the United States in my early 20s, armed with a cardboard suitcase, a head full of dreams, and three English words, yes, no, and Maria. My friend Sarita and Fernando, two Cubans that lived here, picked me up from the airport, and I arrived a very, very late at Kennedy. I didn't speak English, but I got lost. They got lost too. They were on the same boat. And finally, they told me what hall to go, and they embraced, I mean, we were running to each other, and that's how I, I arrived at Kennedy. We took, a tra I mean, uh, we took a taxi. They lived in the Bronx. And then looking out, it was dark, but it was night, it was nice, and I start, Maria! Maria, Maria. We got to the house and they said to me, Tania, what, 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 what was that Maria business? I explained to them the finally. While driving to their home in the Bronx, we passed many apartment buildings with fire escapes prompting me to shout Maria. <laughs> I understand that Maria is not exactly an English word. But to me, at that moment, it was. <laughs> I recognized those buildings, the fire escapes from West Side Story from a clip of a movie I had seen in my home in Havana, Cuba. These were the fire escapes from which Maria was standing when Tony sang to her from the streets below. That meant I had arrived. I was in New York City. It so happened that years later, I had the opportunity to tell that story to Leonard Bernstein, the composer of West Side Story, while I was studying with him at Tanglewood Music Center. I remember his reaction. He laughed so hard and so loud. I still recall that moment. Maestro Bernstein had been the lead composer that summer at Tanglewood, mentoring us as young aspiring composers and conductors, helping us to develop our skills while discussing the exciting and challenging new works that were being performed at the festival. He exchanged thoughts with us about a brighter future for the inclusion of new works in standard repertoire. It was immense for me to think that in a way Thanks to his music, I connected with Bernstein long before I met him. It was an amazing moment in my life. Years, by, years before my summer at Tanglewood, and within my first three months in New York, I was awarded a full scholarship at the New York College of Music, and ultimately, New York University, where I was enrolled in an English immersion course which allowed me to build upon the two degrees I had previously earned in Havana and earned two degrees at NYU. Within a year of my arrival in this country, a classmate of mine at NYU, Laura Wilson, who was working as an accompanist for ballet lesson, asked me the following. Tania, I don't feel well. I think that I have a cold. Could you please replace me I play for dance lessons in a school in Harlem. She told, she told me that, I said, yes, I'll do that. You know, it was going to be my first trip to Harlem. My first trip getting a train to Harlem. Something else that I also saw in a clip on television in Cuba. All right, I took the train to 145th Street and San Nicolas. Then I proceeded to walk for a block to an institution nowadays, a place called the Harlem School of the Arts. I arrived at the Harlem School of the Arts, and the person that greeted me there 
was Dorothy Maynard. I didn't know who Dorothy Maynard, I didn't know who anybody was. Dorothy Maynard, I found out later that she was a very famous opera singer who decided to open a school in order to give the arts to children of impoverished neighborhoods. I was there and I met the woman that I was going to actually play for, Meta Spagnardi, who never, who, who was in the same situation with me. Her English was very limited. So everything that she described for me was ta 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 So I would get the book, look for a march, or look for a waltz, or look for a mazurka, and then match the rhythms, and that's how I was playing. Between lessons or between classes, there was a gap of about 15 minutes. In those 15 minutes, I enjoy myself because, I mean, I didn't have a piano, and these classes were accompanied with a baby grant. So it gave me the opportunity to get my shops together and enjoy myself, and besides that, who I was going to talk to since, you know, I didn't have anybody to speak Spanish at the time. I was playing, and all of a sudden, the door opened, and there was this man that went through the entire room and disappeared in the other door. Why I say that is because I follow him. He was so good looking. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It's like somebody that came out of a movie, right? I mean, his demeanor, the way that he walked, he knew exactly what door he was going to. And I, and I, I went like, whoa. Right? But then I dismissed the whole thing. I played for the next class, and the next class, and the next class, and then there was my moment, my 15 moments of playing by myself. I was playing again, and the door opened. There he was. But rather than going to the other door, he proceeded to come to me. <laughs> his, smile, his smile was amazing. And I said, no English, <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> so he laughed and he started, muchachita, bonita. You know what I mean? He started putting all these Spanish words that he knew, Italian words that he knew. We, were, you know, we started laughing like crazy, looking at each other. Then he said, without saying, I got it. So I gave him the number where I was staying. And two weeks after, I got this call, someone talking in Spanish telling me, come to the school where you were at, at which time, where, what room, and he was waiting for me there. All right, I did that. This is my second time to Harlem. But this time, to meet this man, which was going to teach some dancers, four dancers in total. It was four dancers, a bar, him, and me. I didn't know, I didn't know, and in fact, I didn't know that my life was going to change so drastically. Within months of that project, Arthur Mitchell was there looking for a studio to teach his dancers and initiate a project he had in mind. Within months, that project would materialize as the Dance Theater of Harlem, and I became the pianist and then founding music director. Instantly, bang. I had not been aware that Arthur Mitchell was the first principal dancer of the New York City Ballet. I also discovered that Igor Stravinsky had composed works specifically for Arthur Mitchell, choreographed by George Balanchine, and didn't know that joining the Dance Theater of Harlem would result in my becoming a composer, a conductor, a teacher, and a music director. I soon met George Balanchine, Jesse Norman, Cecily Tyson, Jerome Robbins, Ted Chan, and Marianne Anderson. As a result of meeting Arthur, 
I met and collaborated with so many incredible artists, each of them encouraging me and inspiring me to hold on to the dream of becoming the best musician I could be. My work with living composers and my own emergence as a composer began at DDH. Composers such as Coleridge Taylor Perkinson and Marlos Nobre of Brazil collaborated with choreographers to create new works for the company. And what happened? Arthur told me, don't play with any book. Follow me, improvise, create the music that you want to create. Of course, you know, I was an improviser, so that was easy for me. And one day, in the middle of a class, he turns to me and he said, why don't you write a piece? And I'll do the choreography. Well, that was my first ballet. That was the first piece that I wrote, even that I was not a composer. And Joan and I, we were talking about her first piece, and I talk about my, my first piece, and I go like, oh my god, are you going to play that piece again? Oh my god, you, know? <laughs> you see? Because of course now, with my ears now, and, and you know, the, the experience of, of composition is a different trick to hear the first thing that you've wrote. But the thing is that what made me decide to become a composer is that we recorded the piece. The piece went on stage, the choreography, the lights, the audience, the whole thing was so tremendous. When they finished, I said, I better study composition. So that, that was the same thing. Same thing happened. We went to Europe for the first time to the Spoleto Festival, and then they concocted, you know, I mean, it was Giancarlo Menotti and, and Arthur Mitchell, and all of a sudden they say, Tania, you're going to conduct the orchestra. I'm not a conductor. You know all the, the, the ballets by memory. Come on, go, do it. Next day, Italian press, woman conducts orchestra. <laughs> And that's when I say, hmm, I better study conducting, you know? <laughs> you know? So, so therefore, I've been involved in the creation and development of many arts programs and initiatives, including co-founding the Brooklyn Philharmonic uh, Community Concert Series with Julius Isman and Tali Rasul Hakim, two other composers curating the New York Philharmonic's American Eccentrics Festival and co-founding the Sonidos de las Americas Festival of the American Composers Orchestra with Danny Rosas Davis, among others. In 2010, I created Composers Now and the Composers Now Festival. Composers Now empowers all living composers, celebrates the diversity of their voices, and honors the significance of their contribution to the cultural fabric of society. I believe that inclusion in the arts, like diversity in our society, enriches our common experience. A spirit of inclusion was key of all of these projects. It was the common denominator. Inclusion is an idea that could, that could and would help all of us to expand our artistic visions as creators and creators. Inclusion is an idea that needs to be acted upon Inclusion doesn't just happen by itself. Inclusion has to be made to happen, and we can make it happen now. Inclusion, the noun, is a result of including the verb. Inclusion is a description, but including is an action. In 1990, I worked with Jesse Rosen, head of the League of American Orchestra as the Latin American advisor of Sonido de las Americas Festival. That festival continued for five successful years, introducing composers from Mexico, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Argentina, Brazil, and Cuba, and their works to audience in New York's city. One of the highlights of the festival was the delegation of composers from each country dialoguing with composers of the United States, exchanging ideas and their music. I remember Jesse commenting at the time how much he wanted to see the spirit of inclusion we represented in our programming to be reflected in all orchestras, major, regional, and community. And one thing that I can tell you about Jesse, because he's very modest, and the thing is that, yes, we went to Latin America, and we, for example, in Venezuela, we met with Abreu, and we talked and discussed for the first time El Sistema, long before El Sistema landed in the United States. 
Same thing we were talking about all the adventures and transportations that we had to do in order to find these composers that sometimes would not live in the cities. And there was a moment where Jesse and I saw each other inside a bus full of animals. We were surrounded by chickens, by, you know, <laughs> and there we are, trying to find a composer, but we were a match with the population, you know, not going in fancy taxis or anything like that. We were just part of the whole scenery. Nearly 100 years ago, Aaron Copland and Roger Sessions co-founded a concert series in New York dedicated to presenting new, new works from across the Americas. Copland would go on tour of the world as a cultural ambassador of the United States and to found the American Composers Alliance. During his life, he won a Pulitzer Prize for Music, a Gold Medal of American Academy, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Of freedom I'm sorry. People of North America know Villalobos because Aaron Copland brought his music here. This is how we all learn about cultures other than our own, and this is how, through music, we can bring all of us together. I can't help wondering what Copland would think of the diversity we see in concert programming today. I work with John Duffy at Me the Composer to award grants based in part on greater representation in programming. With Lucas Foss at the Bruggen Philharmonic to bring concerts to schools, prisons, hospitals, and to bring diversity of culture to a variety of festivals. With Kurt Masood at the New York Philharmonic in programming the American Eccentrics, a series that presented such composers as John Cage, Alvin Lucier, Pauline Oliveros, and Conlon and Caro, composers who were using traditional approaches in their music. I'd also like to mention that all of these composers were in attendance, including Nancaro, who was brought in from Mexico City. These are some of my efforts. Each of us must find our own way, find the strategy that works within our context and communities. The point is that we need to make the effort. The work must be done. Inclusion is not a description. It is a commitment to action. We can open up dialogues between the music directors, artistic directors, producers, promoters, the audiences, with composers of our future and composers of our time. We can get the composers into local newspapers, magazines, websites, onto community radio podcasts, or at least we can try. We can illuminate our audiences about the work of our composers, that each composer's voice is a unique form of human expression. More to the point, however, it is my belief that art belongs to everybody. Museum walls and concert halls are community resources and community goods. By reflecting our communities, our communities will support and help us, and they will sustain us. So how do we do this? The answer will be different for every institution, for every location, but the answer isn't going to come to us. We need to go and find it. We need to talk to people. We need to learn from them. Rather than wondering where they are, we need to make a commitment to action. Together right now at this conference and in our work, we are building and shaping an artistic legacy. I would like to invite everybody here this morning to be an active contributor to this collective legacy, to this sculpting of how we will be remembered and to invite other voices to help us write our artistic history. We are all part of an important and evolutionary artistic system. What we make of it could be extraordinary. It could quite actually change the world. This is what motivates me in my thoughts about our chair culture and work. The passion of being involved with music is what made me a composer, conductor, professor, arts organizer, and advocate this is out-of-the-box thinking, and we are all proprietors of that type of attitude. This is how I have operated across my career, and this is how I will continue to operate. We are here in the world of the living. It's a good place to compose and create. 
and it's a good place to be an improviser in music as well as in programming and organizational development. Just let's think, we're writing now, in a way, the document that is going to actually tell people of other generations and other centuries what we were all about. Our efforts toward inclusion, toward the empowerment of an idea, our work toward attaining greater diversity by actively working to diversify can foster dialogue. Our efforts to diversify can and will bring out the humanity and empathy in all of us. It will become a part of our common cultural exchange rather than being something we have to try to do. The verb to diversify denotes an effort that will uplift spirits and contribute to building a more balanced, positive, and compassionate world. When I say living composers are among us, are people engaged in human expression? That's not just a philosophical statement. They are here, and at this time, I would like all of the composers present to rise so we can honor and we can acknowledge them. are the people we are talking about. These are the faces of composition today. These are the artists we should be listening to. They are the names we should be seeing on concert programs. I think they deserve a round of applause again. Now, in closing, I just want to bring some powerful words that I read at some point. And as I told you, as a child, I was growing up with a picture of Elvis Presley and the picture of the Eiffel Tower. I never got to be living in Paris. I never got to do it in France, even that I have been visiting you know, the place, when it, and, and including performing. But fate brought me to these shores. Here I am in the United States of the Americas, you know? North America, Central America, South America. I am from this continent, including the Caribbean. And nowadays, there are words that I have kept next to my bed it might not be Elvis Presley, and it might not be the Eiffel Tower. But there are words such as this. Mahatma Gandhi instructed us to be the change you wish to see in the world. That sentence has three verbs. To be, to wish, to see. It's up to us to take it from there. Thank you. <laughs>